Welcome to our St Bart's online service. As you may know, this week has been our week of prayer. And as Jesus has taught us, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And today we're thinking about how that happens as we're sent out by Jesus into the world. And in our first song, we urge and encourage ourselves to be involved in proclaiming the Lord's greatness to others. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Today in our passage, we find Jesus saying to his disciples, freely you have received, freely give. And it's a reminder that as believers, everything we have, forgiveness, new life, the Holy Spirit, a hope and a future, it's all a free gift of God's grace paid for by Jesus 
and given to us in Christ. Maybe uh, this week at times uh, we've wandered from the Lord and gone our own way. And so we have this moment now to, uh, to come back to the Lord, to say sorry and to receive again his amazing grace. I'm just going to pause up for a moment to allow us personally to draw near to the Lord and then we'll pray. Well, let's uh, pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We're sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Father, thank you so much for your amazing grace for us and that gift of eternal life. And Lord, we pray that our hearts would be captured afresh by the wonder of your grace so that we may want to pass it on to others. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to join Bev uh, once again. Good morning, boys and girls. Uh, well, I'm out here uh, in my garden on a very beautiful morning um, and I'm here. Can you see Ridley? Can you see what he might be doing? <laughs> He's not playing anymore, but he was playing with his mouse, which is good news because Ridley has been a little bit unwell. I had to take him to the vets twice this week, which is very sad. And when, pe when, when our pets, or maybe our family get ill, we get a little bit worried, don't we? What kind of things do you worry about? We get worried. Well, when I had to take him to the vets, my very good friend sent me a text and she said, Remember that God is with you and God is your rock. And it reminded me of one of my favourite Psalms in the Bible. And it's Psalm 62. Psalm 62. And it's this. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. When we're feeling anxious or worried, sometimes we just want to, and we worry and we get, we get shaken like this. And we need, we need to know that God is our rock. God is the one who comes with a firm arm round us and says, I am here for you. I am here for you. And God isn't just like our best friend or our mum. God is, uh, God is in control of all things. God loves Ridley and God knows what's going to happen to him. And I can trust God with him. So whatever we're worried about, we can trust God. He is our rock and our salvation. He is the one who holds us tight. So let's say God's word says together. Oh, here we go. The wind, which is much today, it says, we're going to just do verse two. God's word says, truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. I need to remember that Ridley is not my rock. God is my rock. God is the one who is in control. Let's sing to him now.
knees now help me pray to you and trust in you alone it's like a I'm trying to do press ups like a potato trying to swim like a mountain trying to brush its teeth when we don't rely on him when we pray we trust our father that's what jesus said so i'll stop trusting in myself and pray to god instead father help me now to pray and spend some time with you Like a potato trying to swim Like a mountain trying to brush its teeth When we don't rely on him When we pray we trust our Father That's what Jesus said So I'll stop trusting in myself And pray to God instead It's like a Press-ups like a potato trying to swim Like a mountain trying to brush its teeth When we don't rely on him When we pray we trust our Father That's what Jesus said So I'll stop trusting in myself And pray to God instead The situation in Brazil is unbelievable. I mean, even I, I can't even, sometimes it's hard to find words to express that. To every person that I knew, besides our team, is grieving. We don't have time to grieve from one friend or one relative, and then we have another bad news that someone has passed. So it's a trauma that's it's affecting uh, all of us in the country. And what has given us hope is to work with churches, but also work with church networks and church leaders and different kinds of projects and see their, their resilience and how they have been upfront to respond, to support the communities, to, I mean, to bring hope to being salt and light. Tear Fund is working through the local church to influence a fair vaccine distribution, but also to bring hope in different ways and to set the path for our recovery while many of us is waiting for the vaccine. I mean, the role of the church in this situation is fundamental, I would say vital, uh, crucial. I have no words to describe that because now that people are feeling they are they are lost, the the church can bring the sense of belonging. So when we are facing this kind of trauma, people need to to I mean to regain, to recover their belonging, their sense of belonging, hope, and security. And the church, I mean, has this message. Our message is about hope. It's about belonging. It's about inclusion, because. As we work in unity, we are strong. But I, I believe that we are going to recover. And we can lead this way in love and unity. And we are working that we can re reemerge better. If you have chosen to have your vaccine and you want to support the global church, please give to Tear Fund's Recover Together appeal today. Good morning. When I think of Brazil, which incidentally is where I was born, I tend to think of beautiful sandy beaches and those incredible tropical rainforests with rich biodiversity. I think of very skillful football players. But as we've just seen on that video, there's another side 
uh, to the story, another side uh, to the country that uh, is much sadder. It's, of course, a place of deforestation. It's a place where the gap between the richest and the poorest is so stark um, with the shanty towns outside, incredibly uh, rich places as well. And it's a place where the government uh, has uh, mismanaged the economy. It's a place of corruption. It's a place now where um, there's been a lot of denial about COVID and where the rollout and distribution of, of the COVID vaccine has been very disorganized. But we've just heard there on that video uh, of incredible hope uh, and the incredible work of Tear Fund working with the churches in Brazil uh, to make a difference, to be salt and light in, in that country. So let's, uh, let's pray together for Tear Fund and what they're doing in Brazil, but let's also then go on and pray for ourselves a bit as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray for the nation of Brazil. We thank you that the church is growing in Brazil, and we thank you for the work of Tear Fund, uh, particularly what they're doing at the moment in ensuring that vaccine uh, gets to the very poorest in the Brazilian uh, shanty towns and Lord we thank you so much uh, for their energy, their enthusiasm, their appetite for hard work. Thank you for all those workers in Brazil who are uh, making a real difference uh, as they do things in your name Lord Jesus. And we pray Lord for their success at the moment as uh, Brazil still struggles uh, with the COVID pandemic. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's continue to pray for ourselves now as well. And uh, just some short prayers, uh, committing ourselves to the Lord Jesus as well. Lord, as uh, we come to you in prayer now, we want to just thank you, Lord, for giving us life and giving us energy. Lord, we realise that in this country, uh, we have so many advantages, and yet these have been difficult and challenging times with the pandemic. And Lord, we do pray, Lord, that you will continue to give us wisdom as we uh, go about our work and our family life. And as the church begins to open up for services and for other activities as well, we also want to be salt and light in our communities. And Lord, we pray for ourselves as individuals that you would help us to follow you wholeheartedly. And Lord, that we might be people uh, who are able to share the Lord Jesus with others. And we thank you uh, for this in his name. Amen. So on a bit of paper here, I've got in front of me, uh, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. But... I always get it wrong and uh, slightly read it at a, a wonky pace. So you'll forgive me if I read it off the, the bit of paper, but please join in with the words on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
our reading is Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 31. Matthew 10, 1 to 31. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts, no bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them. 
for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forgive me if you're not a fan of the Muppets, but there's a great scene at the end of the film, The Muppets Christmas Carol, based of course on the book by Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. The scene in the film when Ebenezer Scrooge, played by Michael Caine, wakes up on Christmas morning, flings open the window and, and calls a, a young boy, or rather a young Muppet, over to him to ask if the large goose is still in the butcher's window. And then he sends the boy or the Muppet off to get it. Now, I don't know why that scene sticks in my memory, but maybe it's because that sense of calling and sending epitomised in that scene is so fundamental to our lives as Christians. At the heart of the Christian life is a sense of calling and of sending, which is exactly what we see here in this passage this morning. We're going to focus just on the first 15 verses of the chapter and then we're going to look at the rest of the chapter next week. Do you see there at the beginning of this uh, chapter 10, in verse 1, Jesus called his disciples, his 12 disciples, to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. Jesus calls his disciples to him. And then a bit further on in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Calling and sending. Of course, when we look at Jesus dealing with the first disciples, we need to be aware of the things that are unique to that situation. And those things that are applicable to all disciples across all ages, which would include us. So I want us to take a look at these verses as Jesus calls and then sends the first disciples. And see the challenges and the encouragements that there are for us as disciples today. First of all, here in verses two to four, these were ordinary people. For us, this uh, list of names here is, uh, is quite familiar. In reality, they were raw recruits. They were unknown people. They were pretty insignificant. In fact, some of them were outcasts. Matthew, the tax collector, hated by people because he was collaborating with the enemy, the Romans. Simon the Zealot, fundamentally a political activist, but shunned by some. In fact, there is effectively no greater contrast than the two figures of Matthew the tax collector and Simon the Zealot. And in no other context would you have found those two people working together on the same team. This was a motley bunch of people, all very different, each with their own problems and their own difficulties. And yet Jesus calls each and every one of them and sends them, entrusts them with the most significant news the world will ever receive. So 
Some years ago, there was a book published about church life called Building with Bananas. I love the title because it sums up what it means to be church, to be the people of God. All different, all slightly odd and different shapes and sizes, but all loved by God and entrusted with his work for the world. And there's a hint here in the way that the apostles are listed, that they went out in twos on this mission. We are not isolated individuals doing God's work. We're in partnership, working together for his glory. Ordinary people sent out by Jesus. But then secondly, in verses five and six, this is a strategic mission that they're sent on. Uh, there are very uh, specific reasons why the apostles here are told not to go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans. It's effectively a geographical instruction here. Don't go to the Gentile towns, don't go to the Samaritan towns. It'd be like saying, here yeah, from some parts, don't go over to Bristol, don't, don't go over to Chippenham, but stay in the confines of this area. Focus where we are. But there is an additional reason they are to reach out to the Jews first, to the lost sheep of Israel. It's the fulfilment of the Old Testament concern in Jeremiah 50. The people of Israel, God's chosen people, were lost. Their leaders were failing to care for them. Their leaders had led them astray. And so they were the first priority for the first disciples. But for us, that strategic mission is picked up in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, of all nations. And as Jesus' disciples today, there is no limit to the area or to the people that we are to reach. God's love is for the whole world for every soul, for every individual. And the challenge for us is to be strategic in reaching the people where God has placed us, at the, church, at the school gate, at the workplace, in our family, wherever it is. So a strategic mission here. Then thirdly, there is an authentic message. So there, in verses 7 and 8. Do you see what the message is there in verse 7? As to you go proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near. What could that possibly mean? First of all, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is near because the king is near. The kingdom is present where the king is present. And the king is Jesus. His presence means that the kingdom is near, is present. But it's more than that. There is now an urgency about the message. If the king is near, then the opportunity to accept the king and come under his rule to enter his kingdom is here in a way that it has not been here before. And that remains true. And the urgency is still there. This message demands a response. The message that the kingdom of heaven has come near demands a response. If I said to you, oh, the queen is just round the corner, it implies I expect a response from you, either to ignore her and say, oh, I'm not interested, I'm not bothered in seeing the Queen, or to go out of your way to meet her. Yes, yes, I, I want to go now because she's not going to be there for long. And so it is with Jesus, the King of Heaven. There is a decision to be made urgently. But look at the reminder that Jesus gives the disciples and to us in verse 8. See down there, freely you have received, freely give. Eternal life is a free gift from God. 
The gospel is free. We cannot earn our relationship with God and we certainly do not deserve it. It is offered and received freely. Consequently, the challenge to us is to freely and willingly offer that free gift to other people. Because we have experienced the amazing grace of God, and because that has been offered to us so freely, the challenge is for us to have the same attitude ourselves. Perhaps you can think just for a moment of the person who shared the good news of Jesus with you first. Think of their care for you, their love for you, their gracious and generous gift of the gospel to you. How can you, how can we do anything other than offer that free gift as an act of love to those around us. It is an authentic message of the gospel. But then in verses 9 to 10, we see a dependent lifestyle. What Jesus is telling the disciples is that they shouldn't take lots of money on their journey in a money belt, no extras for the journey. Rather, as we see in the next few verses, they are to rely on the generosity of those that they visit. On the surface, that may seem rather strange. Oh, we all like to feel that we are independent and not behoven to others. But that's the point. We are to be totally dependent on God. And God uses other believers, other Christians, to support those particularly who are in full-time gospel ministry. The parallel to, with today is essentially with those who are in full-time ministry. The Apostle Paul picks up this principle from Jesus and teaches in 1 Corinthians that when uh, he is in Corinth, he has the right to be financially supported by the church, even if he doesn't uh, draw on that right. But what does that look like? Well, there are two aspects of it here. Firstly, the gospel is commended by a simple lifestyle. By living simply, all Christians, whatever our occupation, all Christians can show that we depend not on ourselves, but on God. We make wise and careful use of our resources and our possessions. God provides all that we need, but not necessarily all that we want. And a simple lifestyle can in turn give opportunity to be generous in our support the gospel ministry. Someone once said that a £40,000 salary does not need to support a £40,000 lifestyle, but rather it can also support others who are in some kind of gospel ministry in this country or abroad. And so those of us in employment, finding ways to be generous by simplifying our lifestyle is an important witness to the gospel. And as we look further on in the passage, one way we do that is the generous use of our homes and our possessions. And so we will welcome others generously into our homes. Sometimes that will be visiting missionaries. I've personally been on the receiving end of such extraordinary generosity over the years as people have opened their homes to me when I've been away preaching in this country or abroad. And I know that people like Roger Carswell would testify to the significance of that generosity in gospel work. But there is also a reminder here 
that all of us need to be dependent upon God for the practical needs in our lives. We may not be called uh, to the way that George Muller uh, worked this out, but here's an example to us of the trustworthiness of God in providing all that we need. Uh, George Muller, you may know, uh, established an orphanage in Ashley Down in Bristol in the 1800s. And he sought to trust God for every provision. It's a wonderful story that on one occasion the orphans were all sitting down at the table for breakfast and they gave thanks to God for the food that he had provided, even though there was absolutely nothing to eat in the house. And as they finished praying, the baker knocked on the door with sufficient fresh bread to feed everybody. And then the milkman knocked on the door and gave them plenty of fresh milk because his cart happened to have broken down in front of the orphanage. It's not that Muller's way of depending on God was any more spiritual but it was an extraordinary de uh, demonstration of God's provision. And faithful gospel ministry always needs generous gospel givers. And God will provide all that we need, whether we're gospel workers or gospel givers. And then finally, here in these first 15 verses, we find a divisive message. Everything we've said so far is a great encouragement to the disciples now, just as it would have been an encouragement to the first disciples of Jesus. God uses ordinary people like you and me for his extraordinary work. God sends us to the ends of the world in his strategic gospel mission. God gives us an authentic message of the kingdom of heaven to freely give to others. God encourages a simple lifestyle and dependence upon him, knowing that he is faithful and trustworthy. And those are challenging, but they are encouraging. And then comes the final few verses. And here we see that this is a divisive message. The good news of Jesus will not be received with enthusiasm by everyone because it demands change. It demands humility. It demands repentance. The way it's expressed here is that the disciples are to visit a town or village and look for a place to stay. A worthy person here is someone who will receive them and receive the message that they bring. And there are two possible scenarios. In the first, they are welcomed and they stay in the home. In the second, they are rejected and they leave the home. But what we need to understand is this. Welcoming Jesus' disciples is effectively welcoming Jesus. They come, as we see in verse 1, with the authority of Jesus. To welcome them is to welcome Jesus. Therefore, the other side is equally true. To reject the disciples of Jesus is to reject Jesus and his message because his disciples represent him. So this is a divisive message. And next week we'll look at the rest of the chapter where Jesus warns us in verse 35, for I have come to turn a, fa a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. 
Maybe that has been our experience as a Christian. It has brought us into conflict with friends and with family. But that is part of what it means to be called by Jesus and sent by Jesus. We don't deliberately make ourselves difficult or objectionable. If we are rejected, it must be because of the gospel, not because of us or our personalities. But we do need to be ready for that and to pay that price. And so just as Jesus called his first disciples, so he calls us. Just as he sent his first disciples, so he sends us to share the good news of the kingdom of heaven, that the king is here, the kingdom is near, freely offering eternal life to all. And the question for us today is simply this. Will we respond to his challenge to go? wherever that is for each one of us, to go. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you call us and send us on your mission to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven is here in the person of Jesus. Father, thank you for that enormous and amazing privilege that you've given to us. We pray that you'd help us to rise to that challenge, knowing that we do so not in our own strength, but in the strength of your spirit living within each one of us. And we ask it to the glory of your name.
find the words in that last song very challenging as we recognize such need uh, all around us well let's keep praying uh, for the lord's help to stir our hearts so we may bring something of the love of jesus to others let's pray our oh, father we're very aware of our own weakness and often our cold hearts and so lord we pray that you would stir us up and send us out to be your people in the world. Lord, help us not to be afraid of others and what people may say or do. Lord, help us to know your love and care and the help of your Holy Spirit. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to say as we finish, um, do join us uh, this evening on our YouTube channel for our evening service. We're, we're looking again at the Lord's Prayer. That should be great. And do keep praying for our students this week. We have our Discipleship Week starting today and running over the next week. So do be praying for our students. Well, thank you so much for joining us and may God bless you.